John chapter 8 says this. It's, um, you will have heard this scripture, a lot of you, but this is uh, an incredible passage of scripture. It starts in verse 27, uh, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It says this. It says, they did not understand that, they had been speaking, uh, that he had been speaking to them about the Father. This is Jesus talking to a group of the Jews. And it says, so Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. It goes on to say, he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. That's a good way to live life. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. It goes on to say, verse 31, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we will become free? But Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in your house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do, not, uh, you do what you have heard from your father. This is an incredible passage of scripture, and uh, I just want to start off by framing it with this, is that Jesus is talking here to Jews who have believed in him, right? So this is not to the non-believers. This is not to people who, who are atheists. They, these are Jews who have been listening to his teaching, and he says specifically, he said to the Jews who believed in him, in other words, he drew them aside or he spoke deliberately to these people who had placed their faith in him, and he said these words, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Incredible. We, you will, a lot of us have heard their scripture quoted in measure when people say the truth will set you free. But I love context in scripture. I love, I love reading what all, all of what it says. And, and it says very clearly here, it says, if you will abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. Only after abiding in God's word and being his disciples, only then will you know the truth. And only by knowing the truth is the truth able to to set us free. I wonder if anybody's ever looked in a mirror before and, uh, and not liked what you've seen. Maybe after a Christmas period or a, a holiday break and, you know, you've been doing so well with your eating plan and, 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 and then you get back from holiday and you look in the mirror and you swear you've doubled in size. Does anybody relate to what I'm talking about? You, you don't like the image that's been reflected back to you. And so what do you do? Find another mirror, right? This mirror must be lying to me. I, it's not possible that, that what this mirror is telling me about myself is true. You know, the, the Bible is often referred to, not often, it's, it's referred to a couple of times as a mirror. In other words, as we look into the mirror, it reveals truth to us. You know, often when you look in a mirror, our minds would much rather, the, the easier solution to when we see something in a mirror we don't like is just to change another mirror. We, we convince ourselves it's one of those fun mirrors, you know? It's one of those ones that makes our waist seem about 15 centimeters wider than it really is. And it's much easier for us to find a mirror which shows us something that we want to see. However, God's word is a mirror that is completely objectively true. And so when you look into the mirror, it may sometimes show you things that are discomforting to you, <laughs> but they are entirely, objectively true. I believe that as a society, we have trained ourselves to be worried about me doing this. <laughs> We've trained ourselves that if we don't like what we see, if we don't like the way the mirror is, we'll just change it. That was disappointing. 
Let's rewind three seconds. We've trained ourselves as a society. If we don't like what we see in the mirror of God's word, that was better. We change it. That was much better the second time. And if we still don't like it, we just keep going. And then once we destroyed the whole truth, we pick up the bits that suit us. And we go, yeah, I like this bit. This is the good angle of me. I'll carry this one around. The problem is, is that when we have bits like only pieces of the truth is, ah, I was just joking. <laughs> they can be dangerous. We only have pieces of the truth. Rather than helping us, it can actually harm us. Man, I should be in the, East, the Christmas production. There was such good acting. Such good acting. Wow. <laughs> oh. And so this conversation, I remind you, was not to people who didn't believe that Jesus was who he said he was. He framed this conversation to people who believed. And he says to them, forget those others who don't believe yet. I'm talking to you. I need you to abide. And a different translation says continue. To continue in my word consistently. To remain in my word. In fact, I've titled, entitled this message, Strength That Remains. Because the way we, we are able to remain is by remaining in God's word. Remain strong, we remain, we continue on in God's word. You know, Jesus hasn't left us to our own devices. He hasn't. I love the fact that Jesus says, he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. That just like Jesus, God's promise to you is, is that if you would stick with him, he's faithful to stick with you. He won't leave you nor forsake. You're in this world and you're living this life and there are some truths which may present uncomfortable, some truths which don't make the Christian life the easiest life to choose. And despite that, God's promise is that he will not leave you. And his encouragement, his example to us is that he didn't do things that pleased the crowd, but he did things that were always pleasing to the Father. In other words, what am I saying here? I'm saying this, is that even God in the flesh was about pleasing God. Even God in the flesh wasn't about pleasing the multitude and the crowd and everybody else to like him. No, he was about doing the things that please God. And so as I read this scripture, I just got a couple of thoughts I want to check out there tonight. And I believe you'll be encouraged if you lean in and uh, you'll be encouraged. I want you to take notes if you can. But the first point I've got tonight, if you're, if you're a point taker, is that as Christians, we have to be more faithful to our doctrine over our culture. We have to be more faithful to our doctrine over our culture. And now I know doctrine's not like a, it's not like a sexy Christian word, you know, like, oh yeah, love, not like faith, like, oh, I love faith. If you say doctrine and straight away some of us are inclined to, to switch off, but, but hear me out. I'm talking about the oracles and the truths of God. We have to be more committed to who God is, to what he says, to his commands and to his promises than we are to what culture allows us to feel comfortable with. We have to be more faithful to doctrines than our culture. And so the challenge we have is this, is that we find ourselves, even as a, in the church, even as Christians, often tethered to our culture. And so what we'll do is we play this game where we keep the world at arm's length, right? And we think, I'm not like them, I'm at arm's length. Look at me being different, being salt and light. But the, the, the thing with the world is and the culture is, is that the culture doesn't stay the same. It keeps sliding and shifting further and further away from the truth. And what we do sometimes as Christians is we keep the world at arm's length, but we still are tethered to it. So we follow along with the culture, still at arm's length, and so we feel good about ourselves because we're at arm's length from the culture, but without realizing that as the, the culture drifts, even though we're at arm's length, we've still moved from the original place where God wants us to stand. We find ourselves tethered to the culture and you know, here's, here's the challenge we all face, is that we see time and time again Jesus being moved by compassion, yeah? 
He was moved by compassion, and so he stopped, and he ministered to the, to the woman who had an issue of blood. He was moved by compassion, and so he prayed for this person, or, or, he, or he stopped for the blind man who called. He was moved by compassion, and he stopped and did stuff, right? But even though he was moved by compassion, he never once left his calling or his mission. And so we need to learn as Christians to have, and just hear this, untethered compassion. Untethered compassion. When we see someone lost, we see someone hurting, we see someone in a bad way, someone comes to us in a predicament or a situation about their identity, and we can see the complication of their circumstances. If you are not a terrible person, you feel for them. You, your compassion moves you for them. You, you empathetically, you, 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 uh, you, 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 imp- you empathize, sorry, with their emotions, with the hurt, with the pain, with the sorrow, with how they're feeling, with their desperation. We are, we are compassionately moved, right? And, and so compassion compels us. It, it moves our hand, but it's not meant to move our feet. Compassion is meant to move our hand, but it's not meant to move our feet. Our feet are meant to remain solid on the rock, and our hand can be moved by compassion to extend the grace of God into situations. And so here's the challenge we have as Christians, right, is that it's easier for us to bridge the gap by moving the truth to people than it is to dra- drag people from their current circumstance to the truth. It's easier. It's much simpler because you're not expecting anybody else to compromise. You just have to compromise instead. It's, it's simpler. You know, if you're the kind of person that, um, y- y- there may be some people in here who give tasks but really struggle to give tasks because you'd much rather just do it yourself, you know? And, and, and this is exactly the kind of thing that's happening here. As Christians, we sometimes find ourselves trying to do the task on behalf of God. But as Christians, we need to believe, we have to believe that God is unchanging yesterday, today, and forever, yeah? And we also have to believe that he's able to change circumstance which seem impossible. And that, that remains where uh, that, that tension point where our compassion meets truth, is that our compassion can move our hand, but it cannot be allowed to move our way of thinking. It cannot be a, uh, allowed to move our feet. It cannot be allowed to shift our truth so that it meets that person in compassion. We find ourselves with this gap that seems to be ever-increasing. But the thing is, is that God will not change. He never will change. Other people's circumstances can change, but our God will not. I say that to you, and a lot of people feel, like, have this innate feeling that that's a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. That's incredible. That means every day you wake up, God's love remains perfect. Every day you wake up, God's grace remains abounding. Every day you and I wake up, even when we're faithless, He remains faithful. When we're weak, He remains strong. He remains perfectly holy. He, may, he remains just. His, wins, his wisdom is perfect. You know, every single day, he remains the same, and that's a good thing for us. The moment he moves, he's no longer the God that deserves our worship. He's no longer the, the true God. We, we find ourselves worshiping a make-believe God, a God that we've made up to suit our way of thinking, to suit our compassion. And so we don't actually want God to budge. We don't want his truth to budge. My second thought is this, is that we live in a culture where, you know, we can go both ways. We can either find ourselves being too liberal, you know, being too free, uh, taking liberties with God's truth and deciding what works and what doesn't work. We can find ourselves saying to ourselves, yeah, this truth is convenient for the culture we live in. This truth isn't. So we, we can go that way as Christians. We can also go the other way. We find ourselves calling things sin that aren't actually sin. We can find ourselves overly legalistic. Just like we can swing towards liberality, we can also drift towards legalism. You know, once, uh, this is probably about 20 years ago, but my my uncle, he's a Samoan man, and uh, he was a, a, a pastor, and he was invited to speak at this church, and he arrived at this church, the guest speaker arrived about half an hour early, you know, and, and he's there, and he's wearing a bright floral shirt, like, you know, button-down shirt, and, uh, and he gets to the door, and these two men meet him and say, sorry, you're not dressed appropriately to come in here. And so he goes, 
I, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm meant to be in this, in this meeting. I've, I've, I've been uh, invited to come. And he said, sorry, sir, you're not dressed appropriately for this meeting. And so he goes out and sits back in his car, and he waits outside until the pastor who invited him real, I started freaking out inside, saying, where, where is this guy? Has he, has he missed the meeting? Did he, did he forget about it? And he hears through the grapevine that these guy, this guy had been turned away, and he runs outside, and he finds my uncle sitting in the car in this bright floral shirt reading the Bible, and he wasn't allowed into church because these people had decided that he didn't quite meet up to this dress code that was needed to enter into this holy service. All I'm saying is this. It's amazing how just like we can, uh, we can change God's word to, to suit the people we're meeting with and, and suit our lifestyles. Likewise, we can also sometimes go to great lengths to exclude people that God has removed every obstacle to make a way for. I don't know about you, but as Christians, we have to walk this line where the truth is the truth. And so, I, and so we, we, we have to keep this balance where we're not becoming uh, overly liberal, and I, I use that word loosely, and we don't find ourselves becoming overly, uh, overly legalistic either because God's truth is the truth. And you know, who are we to add obstacles that Christ himself removed? In fact, Jesus said he's removed every obstacle except for himself. He remains the last stumbling block. Why add extra? Has anybody been watching the Olympics? You see like the hurdles and the steeplechases. Don't, how, how do you even get into that sport in the first place, you know? It's like there were criminals running away from the police and they got, like, oh, I'm quite good at this. <laughs> but let's not add obstacles to the race that can sometimes be difficult enough as it is. My third point is this. I'm just, these are kind of, they're not necessarily coherent, so just, they're all individual, right? Um, I believe that as, as Christians, with truth, we need to uh, allow ourselves to have leaders rather than just speakers. Okay, yep. Yeah? We need to allow ourselves to have leaders rather than just speakers. You know, talk can be cheap. Even saying good stuff can be said insincerely. Yeah, it can be said insincerely. And so we have, within the entire world, but also within Christian culture, we have a culture which chases good speakers, but actually needs good leaders. We chase good speakers, but we need good leaders. And, and, and I believe as Christians, we need to, it is unwise for us simply to chase speakers. What am I talking about? I'm talking about finding somebody who will actually walk the walk of faith with you. They'll be there in the trenches for you. They'll pray with you. They'll share the uncomfortable truth with you while looking you in the eye. They'll rejoice with you. They'll cry with you. They'll pray for you. They'll earnestly serve you. I'm talking about leaders, not just speakers. And, you know, at the very last part of the scripture, it says, Jesus says to the group of people uh, who, are, who are shocked by the fact that he's saying that he could give them this freedom that they don't, they don't have, and he says, I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Two different types of experience. Jesus had seen firsthand. I'm talking about, this is what I'm talking about. This is the kind of relationships we need in truth. People who have seen, who we get to see firsthand, actually live out the message they preach on stage. We get to see, we get to test their word as faithful and fruitful in their life. And likewise, we also need to, to be seen by them. You know, it's so much easier for us to take on the things which are convenient for us to take on from a message. And this is why I believe why you talk to people and they, they say, I heard a great message for you the other day. <laughs> that message really spoke to me about what you need to work on. <laughs> I'm talking about us creating relationships with humility, honesty, transparency before God, you know, God went to great lengths to tear the veil. And despite that, a lot of us fight real hard to put a veil back up again. I want to remind you this, is that any veil you think you have is only one-way glass. God can see right through it. Here's some questions for you. With the truth, aligning yourself with people who are leaders and not just speakers, are you willing to change your mind? Are you willing to change your mind? I've, I've trained myself in this over the years. 
where I used to read scripture and I would highlight the bits I thought sounded really nice. Yeah? I flipped it now. Now I read scriptures and I highlight the bits which make me feel uncomfortable about the way I'm, way I'm living. I've learned I have a lot of opinions. And not all of them naturally line up with God's word. See, we have a culture, we are in, live in an age where if you give a kid a game, there's this feature that is called player create. There's going to be something that pops on the screen up here behind me. Player create. Whereas you're allowed to choose the player which you like the best. You can assign to, your, to the player the attributes you want. I want my player to be this tall and this fast. I want them to have light skin or dark skin. I want them to, you know, have a good smile or, you know, I want them to be friendly or you, you, can, you can choose the player you want. I believe this, this culture is replicated also in the way we view God. We want to have a God who we can create. We, we, we apply the player create model to our Christianity sometimes. And we just want a God that fits into our box, makes us, un- us comfortable. Well, I want to let you know, I've learned very, very quickly as you actually lean into God's word and ask his Holy Spirit to convict and lead you, that there are a lot of truths that you'll find in the Bible that don't make you feel happy about your life. What if I told you that that wasn't God's ultimate desire? What if I told you he was less concerned about your happiness and more concerned about your holiness. And here's the crazy thing, is that in your holiness, you'll find yourself infinitely more happy. They're not mutually exclusive. My last point is this. Jesus says this really profound (laughs) profound saying as I close. He says this, he says, you notice I haven't really even talked about the, the main scripture. Abide in my word, you are the truly my disciples. You will know the truth, the truth will set you free. I'm not talking about freedom tonight, I'm actually talking about abiding in God's truth. Remaining in God's truth. So he says this, he says, the slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. It's really difficult sometimes to tell the difference between a slave and a son. They're both in the house, they're both doing stuff. But the slave only has a temporary lease, he's got to go eventually, the son gets to stay forever. He goes on to say, If the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And I know that you are the offspring of Abraham. In other words, but 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 he's saying this. He says, don't lean merely on your heritage. So what? Your grandparents were pastors and your parents were pastors. That's not not the, the, the golden ticket. It doesn't necessarily mean anything when you stand before God and, 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 and you're judged on your choices and your actions. You can't just say, well, here's my parents' resume. I've got 17 generations in a row. And praise God for, for godly legacy. I'm just trying to say, ultimately, at some point, you've got to choose for yourself. Yeah. He says this. He says, I know you are of the offspring of Abraham, and yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. You seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. First time I read this, I thought, that's so extreme. And these people are crazy. That's so extreme. Kill. And I thought, you know what? Maybe not so extreme. Maybe not so extreme. They wanted to kill him because his words shook that deep, adopted, internal truth. And while it seems harsh, it can be very easy for us to do the same thing. We can assassinate the true God and replace them with a convenient God. We want Christ, but the Joe version. We want Crow. We assassinate the true God. We kill him because there's no true place for his words in our life. I wonder when the last time you deliberately made space for God's word in your life. And I'm not talking about the the novel space that putting him on the mantelpiece and be like, yes, Lord, here's your space. You can, have, you can have an oil portrait over the fireplace, Lord. What a great place. I'm talking about giving him and his word the rightful place in your life, the authoritative word, the, the infallible word of God, which does not fail. I'm talking about his word being to you and being to me the ultimate end of truth. I'm talking about his word being ultimate revelation of who God is. I'm talking about when his word makes you uncomfortable because it doesn't line up with the way you feel about a situation or think. I'm wondering if you've given him the place to be right and for you to be wrong. 
Is there place in you for his word? You know, I'd love to say this is just a society issue. This is just the issue that happens, you know, outside of church. But as a pastor, I've, I've seen time and time again sometimes where it's easy for people to disconnect, where it's hard to share the hard truth with people because they've got Christian pride, you know. They've walked with God so long now, they know, you know. No matter how long you've walked with God, you need to give permission. We need to give permission to God's word to prove us wrong in our own thinking. His truth, no matter how inconvenient, no matter how late, late it comes, it, it, it's still truth. It's objective no matter what. And God's desire is not that we'll settle for, oh yeah, I like that bit. Oh yeah, I like that bit. Not to settle for the pieces, but that we'll embrace, we'll remain in the whole thing. And as we remain in our truth, only then will we truly know it. And as we truly know it, only then have we given it the power to actually set us free. Amen.